this is an introduction to stem shortage claims. So I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about what a stem shortage claim is and whether they're true. The basic upshot is that they're not true. Uh, STEM is S-T-E-M, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And it's an acronym that goes back a ways, but came into widespread use in the mass media and public policy in the early 2000s, primarily in the context of education policy, immigration, and some other areas that are in practice kind of tied together. So a STEM shortage claim is a claim that scientists, technologists, engineers, mathematicians, especially the last few years, computer science programmers, software engineers, are in short supply. There's an sh actual shortage uh, which could you know, destroy the country. These are not new claims. For various fields, these claims date back at least to the height of the Cold War, to Sputnik, to the 1950s. Then the claims tended to focus on physics and some other areas of engineering and science related to things like nuclear weapons and rocketry. In the last approximately 20 years or so since the Cold War, they've more and more focused on the computer industry, electronics, electrical engineers, in the last few years especially computer science and software engineering. Uh, they are high, heavily promoted by heads of companies that employ STEM workers, by heads of universities and research organizations that, again, employ scientists typically. Uh, you don't actually hear them so much from the employees. It's actually the employers. It's often expressed as a crisis. The end of the world is coming if we don't have more STEM workers, more scientists, more programmers. It's often tied in with patriotism, that the country is going to get overwhelmed by our enemies, by Soviet Russia back in the Cold War, by India, China, terrorists, other kinds of threats today. Let me give a specific prominent example of these types of claims um, today. So Microsoft and its CEO, or former CEO, I should say, Bill Gates, is a big promoter of this type of claim. So. Uh, Bill Gates gave testimony to the House Committee on Science and Technology in 2008, and here's what Bill Gates said. I know we all want the U.S. to continue to be the world's center for innovation, but our position is at risk. There are many reasons for this, but two stand out. First, U.S. companies face a severe shortfall of scientists and engineers with expertise to develop the next generation of breakthroughs. Second, we don't invest enough as a nation in the basic research needed to drive long-term innovation. Now, in addition to this testimony by Bill Gates, Microsoft has put out a national talent strategy. They have a long history, uh, both before and after 2008, of claiming that they face a terrible shortage, that we need to train and educate more scientists, engineers, specifically programmers and computer science graduates. What's remarkable about that is that almost immediately after this testimony, Microsoft laid off 3,000 people, and in the ensuing nine years, by its own announcements and press releases, has laid off at least 35,000 of these allegedly rare and difficult to find STEM workers. Um, and in fact, it's probably more because uh, Microsoft had uh, a policy called stack and rank, a very common practice in high tech companies, where you take these rare, difficult to find people and you grade them on a curve, you rank them and you take the bottom 10% or some number like that every year and lay them off. Even though they're so hard to find, apparently, you know, laying off 10% of your highly qualified and difficult to find employees somehow makes sense to Microsoft. And nor is it alone in doing this. Those 35,000 people included numerous uh, STEM workers, scientists, engineers, programmers, etc., at the Nokia division of Microsoft. So Nokia is a cell company in Finland. And what's interesting about that is that Finland is one of the highest rated uh, countries in the world for its science and math education as a very strong science and math workforce. Uh, and, and often these STEM shortage things involve a comparison of how bad education supposedly is in the U.S., to other countries like Finland in particular, which has some of the highest scores on international tests. However, even though, even though Microsoft had somehow gotten all of these hard to find folks in Finland, they proceeded to lay them off, right? Instead of assigning new work to them or reorganizing their projects, but retaining these difficult to find employees, they were jettisoned as part of these 35,000, which includes many people in the United States and elsewhere and an unknown number of people laid off through stack and rank and other sort of stealth layoff methods. 
And this is very common. Many, many high-tech companies are routinely laying off substantial percentages of their workforce. Uh, they often seem like they're targeting older people. And by older, we mean people with more than 10 years of experience. We mean people over 30, 35. So a lot of companies you say, well, that's awfully young for some sort of age discrimination. But that's what they seem to do. So STEM shortage claims are pervasive. They have been pervasive at least since the time of Sputnik and the Cold War. They evolve over the years, changing in the way that they're presented. They're never quite the same from year to year. But the basic claim is, hey, American education is terrible. The students are these wimps who can't take these tough courses like high school algebra. Uh, because of this, you know, we can't find people. Oh my god, how horrible. And so one of the things that they therefore are saying to people is, okay, go get a CS degree, go get a physics degree, go get some kind of degrees, and you know, jobs waiting for you is what they seem to imply, right? You're warm, you're breathing, you can do the job, hey, we'll take you, because we are desperate. It's a severe shortfall. Now, the bottom line is that the STEM shortage claims are largely false. In the case of academia, PhD programs, scientific research fields like physics, my degree is in physics, uh, they're totally false. These programs, which are mostly funded by the government, so research in physics, for example, is funded by various offices, bureaus within the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, I think NASA provides some funding for a couple specialized areas. But nonetheless, these programs consistently, and with, this is a matter of federal policy, the government funds the salaries of the graduate students, and they fund far more graduate students than there are long-term jobs, right? In other words, professorships or permanent positions at government research labs at NASA, places like that. So there's a huge overproduction in essentially every one of these government-funded STEM research fields, whether it's physics or chemistry or biology or whatever. Um, and by a matter of public policy, although it's rarely explicitly stated, they fund far more of these graduate student and postdoc positions, supposed trainees who are you know, paying their dues and getting trained to fill the supposed shortage of physicists or biologists or whatever they happen to claim. So by public policy, they fund the overproduction of large numbers of people who are specifically trained in these highly specialized fields, and I'll get to why that's important. So what happens to those people? Well, generally they end up as some sort of computer programmer or software engineer. The analyst, data scientists are popular right now. But they don't end up in physics. They don't end up in aerospace research. They don't end up in the field biology, genetics research, the areas that they're recruited to and that they're funded for as trainees. So there are many more people trained than there are uh, you know, positions. Now what about industry claims like uh, Microsoft and Bill Gates? Here we get into a sort of constantly moving, shifting definitions. So generally, the companies will say something like, we have a shortage of qualified engineers or a shortage of engineers with special skills. So things like qualified and special skills are very general. Usually after they say that, they will then jump to talking about how bad schools are. And it's K through 12. They don't go after the universities they're actually hiring people from. So Microsoft doesn't go to your high school and hire people for the most part except for maybe a few internships. But they go to you know, MIT or Caltech or Carnegie Mellon, and they hire a tiny fraction of the people that come out of those schools. Uh, that's where they're actually hiring people. But they're OK with those schools. What they are not OK with is K through 12 teaching in public schools. And in particular, they tend to point a finger at some public school systems that are very poor, like Washington, DC, Newark. Um, inner city schools, and also sometimes schools in rural areas like Appalachia, Kentucky. So what they seem to be saying is, we face a shortage of the kind of basic science, math, thinking skills that are taught in schools in high school. So algebra, calculus, you know, basic science courses. AP computer science gets emphasized a lot because almost no Americans take AP computer science. Huge numbers of American students take AP calculus, and both the AB and the BC, the more advanced calculus exams, and take the courses. Huge numbers of them, and huge, we need several hundred thousand each year. Similarly, large numbers of Americans take AP statistics, that's over 100,000 students per year, take the AP statistics exam. Large numbers, like in the hundreds of thousands, take AP physics, AP chemistry. 
So there's, if you look at those STEM areas, you see that actually there's a lot of people who are interested in STEM fields. Why wouldn't they be? They're told there's a shortage, there's plenty of jobs. So in order to claim that there's this terrible shortage and the problem is K through 12, they have recently, the last few years, tend to focus on AP computer science, which almost nobody takes. Of course, almost anybody today who's taking AP physics or AP calculus or something like that has got a computer, is programming in Python or maybe Java for Minecraft or, or things like that. So the vast majority of those nerdy kids taking those AP uh, science and math courses and taking the exams, they definitely have basic computing skills. They're definitely high percentage of them are probably programming in Python or some other, you know, popular programming language that's relatively easy for high school students to do. And some of them are programming in various kinds of very challenging things. But that doesn't get mentioned in, in most of these accounts. So the pitch here is that there's this terrible shortage. What they seem to be saying is there's this terrible shortage of basic skills that you learn in high school. This is very hard to reconcile with the layoffs like the ones I discussed at Microsoft. Because every one of those people, every one of those scientists and engineers and, and programmers at Nokia had those skills. They went through Finland's excellent you know, high school and college system, one of the best in the world. They have those skills. The people that are being targeted and laid off by these companies have those skills in spades. All those older scientists, engineers, programmers, and people that the company somehow won't hire, there's no question they have those skills. They, you know. And many students that they aren't interested in hiring from Stanford or MIT or the best schools in the world, and they often don't hire, everybody who applies certainly have those skills. So when they're confronted about this obvious disconnect, they will retreat or change what they talk about to two things. One of these is we actually what we're talking about are specialists who have several years, usually at least three years, of paid professional experience doing, for example, C++ for a commercial employer. Can't be a university, a nonprofit organization, a school, a government research lab, or government program. It's got to be a commercial employer doing, quote, real macho, you know, commercial program. At least three years of paid professional experience. And in fact, usually it's not just one of these skills. It, it has to be the latest C++, you know, C++ 14 or 17 or whatever it is now, it's always the latest. It always has to be three years or more of experience, even if the actual tool came out two years ago, three years. It's usually several of these tools, and it's supposedly they, these are the people they need. And this is how they can explain that they're not hiring all sorts of people who otherwise certainly have these basic, you know, math and science, critical thinking skills, general programming skills that they've acquired, whether from a formal course or from programming Minecraft or a game in Python or other kinds of activities or doing statistical data analysis as a biologist. Many different contexts where people learn programming, but it's not this macho, cool, commercial programming, okay? Not the professional programming, okay? So this is what they claim. They also make another claim which often overlaps, which is they're looking for the best, the 10x programmers, the 10x scientists, the 100x, the very best in the world, these mutant supermen who are very rarely identified by name, who supposedly do 10 times as much work as the you know, typical, let's say, I mean, what we're talking about are people who are supposedly 10 or 100 times better than the typical graduate of MIT, the typical Caltech, somebody who was in the top of their class at the Bronx High School of Science, you know, they went to MIT, they got a degree there, you know, in whatever, computer science or physics or whatever, they were, you know, they have an IQ of 180 or something. That's those, that, bleh, bleh, no way, right? It's these super beings who are, you know, supposedly smarter than Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. I mean, they will often say, we want to hire people who are smarter than us to tell us what to do, right? You know, you're the most powerful person in the world, and we want to bring somebody in who's better than you are, who's stronger than you are, who could push you out or take over and take your place. Yeah, right. That's not what they want. But this is the kind of explanation that they give for why, for example, they don't hire some 35-year-old or 40-year-old engineer who's now over the hill, why they don't hire some seemingly well-qualified new college graduate. Uh, maybe the new college graduate is from the wrong ethnic group that's not popular, but they say, oh, that's, that's not the issue here. We need these three years of paid professional experience doing C++ and iOS and Xcode and you know several other requirements. Of course, these requirements are often so picky that probably nobody could meet them, or certainly very few people. 
do they really want these super specialists, these 10x programmers, these super people that are smarter than the CEOs, smarter than the people in power in these companies? There's a lot of evidence, actually, at least my personal experience, there's a lot of evidence that's not what they want at all. Right? They don't want people who could threaten them. They don't want people who could take over, could form a competing company, that so on. So they want people that are actually weaker. Maybe they have to hire two of those weaker people versus one, you know, Superman. But, you know, ask yourself a question, say, from the comic books of, you know, Lex Luthor, who has this giant evil empire, right, a corporation. Is he going to hire Superman to be his uh, lieutenant, right? How long is he going to last if Superman moves into, you know, Luthor Corporation? Probably not too long. So they're not so interested in these people in reality. So in conclusion, STEM shortage, STEM is S-T-E-M for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. STEM shortage claims are claims of a desperate, severe shortage of skilled engineers, scientists, mathematicians, very often programmers or software engineers today, that there's a terrible shortage, the country is going to fall apart if we don't get more, you know, go get a CS degree or a engineering degree because, you know, our company is just going to rush right out and snap you up when you get that degree. Those are the claims. Those claims are almost always false. Occasionally there's some specialized areas like petroleum engineering during the fracking boom where there actually is a shortage of specialists. But in general, these claims are not true. Certainly not true in the way that they sound like what they're saying. They are talking in general about super specialists or these purported super programmers, super scientists. And yet, there's a lot of evidence that they don't really want the super specialists and the super scientists and so on. You know, who really wants to hire somebody that's stronger than they are, that can become a threat to them? You've got to have a pretty thick skin, maybe be rather foolish to do that. So this concludes this introduction, and it's the first in a number of videos that I'm going to do about STEM shortage, STEM shortage claims. I'll go into some more advanced issues regarding the STEM shortage claims, which raise a lot of other questions about the economy and our supposedly free press and other topics. Uh, hope you will uh, like this video, and um, in the send me some comments. Uh, like the video if you like it. And I hope you'll return for some of our future videos.